Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. I am excited for this month's edition. I'm excited to bring our guest co-host in, but before we do that, I just wanted to um, tie up a few loose ends from things I mentioned last month. Number one, I had asked about a new podcast format and how the sound quality was, and it was good to hear from people who, for the most part, said it sounded better or they didn't care. Um, And just for those keeping score at home, The subsequent interviews have actually been back on Skype. I did end up getting this platform, but we've had some technical issues using this new one called Squadcast. But I'm happy to report that it's up and firing here um, for this book recap. And I'll try to use it as much as I can going forward um, because uh, I do want the show to sound as as good as it can. Uh, Number two, regarding blindfold puzzles, uh, at the end of the show, again, it was nice to hear from a lot of people. Our co-host, who we'll bring in, in a minute, even conducted a Twitter poll about it. And it seems like maybe 30 to 40 percent of you are doing them. Um, and that's good enough for me to try to keep doing them. I may miss some months here and there, but I've got a couple for the end of this show. And we'll just take it month by month based on how things are going. But my overall plan is to do it um, whenever I can. And um Last thing before we bring our guest in, of course, for for newer listeners, this is um, a break from interviewing someone about their life in chess, and instead we'll be recapping um, some important chess books. Often it's what's considered chess classic. Uh, Today we're going to tackle a very modern book and a book that's a little bit more controversial than to call it a classic, but it's very important as we'll discuss. Um, So... Uh, and I also, before I forget, just wanted to thank everyone from the online chess community. I mean, one of the things I love about this show is getting to interact with everyone and feel like it's a community driven show. Um, and this episode more than any others, I feel that way because, um, we had some great Twitter discussions and I also just relied on the accumulated, excuse me, accumulated knowledge of, uh, other chess enthusiasts. Um, whether it be on on Reddit or the chess.com forums or the Chessable forums, um, as we'll get into. Um, but with all that out of the way, we need to uh, bring our guest co-host in. Um, those of you active online probably are familiar with him. Uh, those of you who are not um, may not be. But in any event, he is a hardcore adult improver uh, studying chess every day. Uh, despite having a job, wife, and kids, and all that stuff. And now, and these books were his idea, as we'll discuss, and now he's joining us. I will finally bring in Neil Bruce. Neil, how are you? I'm doing great, Ben. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm Neil Bruce. I work at a software company as the head of product in Boston. My father taught me how to play chess as a kid, but I didn't play my first tournament game until I was 40, and I was not very good, but I got better over time. And um, through this experience of playing over the last 10 years, I've become a real believer in cycling through tactics on a regular basis and making it part of my regular practice. Coincidentally, I actually played at, at the same club as Michael de la Maza did. He mentions Metro West Chess Club in his book, and I'd love to donate whatever uh, fee you were going to give me to that club. I really love supporting local clubs. Okay. Yeah. So just to be clear, this was Neil's idea. Um, when, when I launched these, uh, book recap, um, uh, podcasts, I, you know, as regular listeners may know, there's a forum that if anyone's interested in helping out co-host and if there's a favorite book you'd like to come talk about, um, I'll link to the forum. And of course I have plenty of volunteers, but I'm always happy to have more. And Neil was, um, was uh, quite eager to discuss these books. And uh, to be honest, um, I hadn't read either of these books, Rapid Chess Improvement or The Woodpecker Method, um, which are the two books we're going to be discussing. Um, Rapid Chess Improvement, I knew about both of them. Um, Rapid Chess Improvement, um, as we'll get into momentarily, is a a bit controversial. Um, Woodpecker Method is a bit more lauded, but it's pretty new. uh, It came out in 2018 from Quality Chess um, by... um, Grandmasters uh, Axel Smith and Hans Tikkanen. 
Um, and we should say Rapid Chess Improvement is by Michael De La Maza. Um, and again, we'll be getting into the books more, but it's just, an, an, it was Neil's vision. I just want to be clear to discuss these two books and kind of tie them together. And the more I dug into this, and of course I've read both books now and, you know, researched a decent amount, the more, the more I dug into this, the, the more excited I was to do this. So, so Neil, thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, I really, when I think of these two books, they roughly have the same model, the same method. Uh, I think one's better than the other, but I think that they're both important. Yeah, and we can't ignore the 16-year gap between these books. Rapid Chess Improvement, um, published in 2002 by Everyman Chess. Um, you know, there's a kind of fabled backstory. Michael De La Maza at the time was a grad student at MIT, which is how, as Neil mentioned, he's from the uh, Boston, Massachusetts area. So that's how it is that Michael played at the same chess club. And Michael, like a lot of us, became obsessed with chess and he felt like he wasn't improving. Um, and he had his own ideas about how to to go about it and ended up sort of um, bringing the spaced repet repetition revolution to the chess world. Um, a, a lot of listeners may be familiar with, with what spaced repetition means, especially chessable users. But basically, um, the idea is that you, um, re you learn an idea, often it could be vocabulary, like with a foreign language, and then you bring it back repeatedly until it's basically seeped into your subconscious. So you bring it back at shorter and shorter time intervals. So you study something and then you uh, don't look at it. You cycle through a lot more things, maybe bring it back in 10 days or two weeks. Uh, different authors in uh, these different authors have different recommendations, but then you bring it back in shorter periods of time until you know it cold. Um, so this is something that's been around in psychology. Those of you who heard my interview um, with USCF master in cognitive science scientist, Christopher Chabri, heard him discuss space repetition as sort of being at the... Um, you know, one of the most important developments in uh, the study of how people learn. And of course, it has lots of applications to chess. Um, and um, Michael de la Maza was on top of this in 2002. So his book does have its flaws, but it's important that he gets recognized for that. And Woodpecker Method and of course, our friends at Chessable um, now are quite on top of the space repetition movement. But with that intro out of the way, um, I think um, we can dig into the books one by one. So we will take them chronologically and um, begin with rapid chess improvement. So, um, Neil, what was your, by the, like, what was your introduction to rapid chess improvement? How did you, um, how did you first hear about the book? Do you remember? I bought the book years ago, and I bought a lot of chess books years ago, and I didn't read mo most of them. Like I think a lot of chess players, and I. I, I played a, a game at my club where I missed a chance to, to win a queen in a two-move tactic. And I also had taken some lessons where uh, my coach had said at the time, you know, you really should work on practicing tactics. And after I, I blundered the chance to win a queen, I was like, enough's enough. And so I grabbed Delamaz's book. This was before Woodpecker came out. This was several years ago. And I said, well, this is a practical method to get better. And so I started working on creating um, tactics. I ended up going the route of physical cards because I like the writing down of, of my solutions. And I've timed myself. It takes maybe 30 to 50 seconds more to make a card than to simply just write it down. So there wasn't a lot of incremental cost to that. I ended up making over 8,000 tactics cards and uh, cycling through them. And so I've got a slightly different variant of, of doing this method, but I feel like it um, it changed my ability to uh, to see more than one or two moves deep. I can now see sometimes five, six, seven moves deep. And so uh, that's really how it started. Yeah. And uh, internet friends of Neil, Neil has made a lot of friends online in the chess world, myself being one of them, will know that Neil has a train commute um, going into, I believe, Boston. I mean, going into wherever it is right. your actual office is. And the, uh, the, the, the flashcards in this case provide... Um, great service to you because that enables you to do it on the commute, right? Yeah. I, I chose to take, frankly, a slower train versus the commuter rail or drive in because that locks me in with a 45 minute commute, which is ideal for me to cycle through these tactics. And it really creates a habit for me and a practice. And then on the weekends, it's not that hard to keep that going. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I can definitely relate to that. Like, uh, 
you know, as a commuter, people always talk about the length of the commute, but it's also the quality. It's um, it's how how many times do you have to switch conveyances yeah. is often what what comes to, what it comes down to in terms of uh, how much you can get done. Um, but yeah, I mean, so so do you do you remember did some so a couple follow ups, Neil, before we dig into the book? Uh, do you mind sharing who your coach was at the time? Uh, no, I I don't mind. Uh, it was actually Dan Heisman. Uh, oh, I cool! Took a, yeah, I took, who's uh, you know obviously been on the the podcast. I took a few lessons from Dan. Uh, what happened was, is I was living in the UK. I took a few online lessons from Dan. He recommended the Coakley books, which I know you also like. Uh, and he talked about don't try tactics that are too hard. Start with really basic tactics, uh, and and like you know maintain one and maintain two. And and what I realized by doing those exercises is there were a lot of basic mating patterns that I did not know. I didn't know their names and I certainly didn't know their patterns immediately. And so I worked on some really basic books. Uh, you know, Dan had suggested a few and I went through those and I went through some more and, and I never set out to make 8,000 tactics cards. I don't think you can. I think what you do is you make one and then you make another and eventually you've got a bunch. And that's what I would say to people is don't, don't set yourself up to fail to set this huge number. I even think trying to do a thousand at a, in a, at a time is too much. I, I think you're better off chunking them into smaller chunks of maybe 200, like Woodpecker Method, which we'll talk about, suggests. But uh, yeah, I, I started working through it and it wasn't always fun, but I, I could see that I was getting better. And so I stayed motivated. I've been doing this for several years now. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, Dan Heisman, of course, as Neil said, he's been on the show, but also in terms of digging into the history of rapid chest improvement in particular, because I mentioned, uh, the author, Michael De La Maza was kind of at the vanguard of this idea. I mean, of course, it's no secret that you should, that you should study tactics to get better at chess, but what, dif what differentiated De La Maza's approach, um, was the idea of repeating the same tactics. Um, even Christopher Chabri in his, his interview um, on Perpetual Chess, which I believe was October of 2018, um, was saying like it's counterintuitive because if you feel like you want to assimilate as many patterns as, pa as possible. So a lot of people will do the tactics trainers on various sites or various tactics books, but once they're done with one, they're done. It seems, um, again, it seems like uh, a, a bit unnatural to go back and do the exact same book. But the the idea is that you're really um, making sure these patterns seep into your brain. And Dan, of course, was on top of this because he's been teaching chess and been like, um, you know, a visionary in the field and writing about chess for so many years. But he also has some stuff on his blog about his experiences with Michael De La Maza because um, he was already a prominent coach, Dan was at that time, and Michael De La Maza reached out to him. And then as we'll get into the, the book, Michael De La Maza won a class prize at the World Open in Philadelphia, and Dan Heisman met him there. So Dan's got a couple entries on his blog about like the whole experience of meeting him. Um, and just to give a little bit more bio on Michael De La Maza, he... So he was a frustrated club player and he devised this system and he wrote this, he wrote a few articles on Chess Cafe, basically laying out uh, his, his study philosophy. And um, the, it involved, um, I mean, it involves several things, but the crux of it is uh, studying tactics and then, you know, selecting a set of tactics. And as Neil said, it can be a variant number. I mean, the, each author has their own recommendation, but then um, repeating them until you really know them. So repeating them over, less time. And anyway, he went on to win the under 2000 section of the world open. So, um, there, we're going to talk about some, um, disciples of rapid chess improvement and of, of many more of the woodpecker method, um, as we go on, but that's just a little background on De La Maza. Um, and then he quit chess. So he, uh, you know, he, he, spearheaded this movement, or at least was one of the first people that I'm aware of to write about it. Um, he put it into practice. He had great results. And once he got to 2000, he felt like it was going to be, a, he said, it's just going to be way harder from here. Um, and he's now, it seems like he's had a pretty successful career. He calls himself an agile coach. I don't know exactly what that means, but I think it means he's a corporate consultant. And I mean, obviously he was going to MIT while this was going on. So, um, one could guess a, a reasonably sharp guy. So he's moved on from chess, but I mean, there's a, a little legacy that endures with this book. 
For sure. And, uh, you know, my, my view, I, I feel a love hate relationship with rapid chess improvement because there are some things that Delamaza says that I think are so true around uh, tactics ability. Uh, really, it's a skill that you can learn. It's not God given. And I think some people f- have a, a fixed mindset around getting better at chess instead of a growth mindset where they think they can get better and, and and Delamaza demonstrated with himself and some of his other people who've gone through his program that, that chess skills can be learned, can be taught, can you can get better at these things. I thought that was a really important point. Uh, the challenge I have, I mean, in his first sentence in the foreword, he says, this is the only chess book that describes the exact training method that a weak adult chess player used to become a strong player. Well, first of all, that's just not true. There are lots of people who've written books about how to get better. But it shows the absolutist mindset that that uh, Delamaza tends to demonstrate throughout the book. Plus, his like shameless self promotion mm-hmm. of his program. Like half the book is shameless self promotion. So I, I think what you have to do, and I would argue that rapid chess improvement could be claimed to be like a parent of the Woodpecker method. Like there, there is some credit to give the guy for. Um, doing repetition and 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 really to me the breakthrough was every time you do a cycle you you need to do the next cycle in half the time it puts pressure on you if you track your your time and both books recommend this you will um, use discipline and you will see improvement in your ability to, to visualize uh, but the the general crux of of Delamaz's book is gather the thousand cards as you uh, tactics as you said he recommends online training. Uh, he also recommends some books if you don't have an online approach. And he he says it's got to be all 1,000 or you're not really a serious chess player, uh, which I don't agree with. But, like, you work through it. And then at the end, you might want to keep doing it, uh, you know, again and again. Uh, but I, some things he says that I think are really smart. One is that you can use a chess program to look at your graph of the game. And what you want to look for is what he calls big squiggly lines. Like you're way up and then you're way down and then you're way up and then you're way down. And I think most players overestimate their tactical ability. And he says, you know, use science, use, use data to, to inform whether or not you need to get better. And he has very specific measures. He says, if you can see one and two move tactics almost perfectly, and you can usually see three or four move combinations, then you're pretty good at tactics. And if you're not, then you need to work on them. And so these, I think, are really practical ways to to decide. Do you need to study tactics? I frankly love the Ben Feingold phrase of stop giving away all your pieces because that's basically the same idea. Yeah. So if you just stop giving away your pieces, you're much more likely to succeed. So I think he he, he drives those points home pretty well. Yeah, he does. And as you say, it's a tough read, honestly. I mean, with the self-promotion, it's just ridiculous. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, he... he uh, you know, there's that 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 like internet meme saying like uh, I, I'm gonna butcher it, of course, but it's like uh, you know most most books should be an article, most articles should be a paragraph, most paragraphs should be a tweet, most tweets should not exist. You know, something like that. This yeah. is definitely this is definitely the book that should have been an article, and it in fact was articles. It was, you know? yeah. So he, I mean, he wrote the articles on uh, on Chess Cafe, and and the articles are are brilliant. They they cut to the crux of the issue and they give the proper advice. And, you know, in a lot of shout out to the chess.com forums and all the threads about rapid chess improvement and woodpecker method, I'm not the first one to point out. You can just read these articles, which are still archived online and I'll link to. And, um, and y- you'll get the the crux of what he's saying. But basically what he was saying is he, he wasn't advancing and tactics were the reason why. And I think that's true um, for, for the vast majority of players. Definitely. Um, under 1800 and even even past that level i mean uh, you know they did an inexact study as we'll we'll get to woodpecker method later but they just took a bunch of games from a single tournament and basically tried to decide which percentage were were decided by tactics and in this particular tournament even the 2000 to 2200 level was like 44 percent or something so i mean it's just hard to underestimate uh, just how important tactics are. And as Neil was saying, it's it's not that glamorous a view of chess. I mean, because it's a beautiful, rich game. So it seems like it shouldn't just be this big math problem, but it's also a competition. 
So uh, when you compete with someone, I mean, it, in chess, being a game of mistakes, I mean, it comes down to to who makes uh, the most mistakes. Um, so again, I, I agree with Neil. He had some great points, but it's not like we're saying you have to rush out and buy rapid chess improvement. It's more just that I do think the guy deserves some credit for his insights. Yeah. I mean, there are a couple points, other points he makes later in the book that I also think are worth mentioning. I mean, I, I'm trying to cover all the best parts of the book, so you don't have to bother to read it if you're listening to this. Huh. Uh, this idea of sitting in your chair and thinking while you're on your opponent's time, I think makes a ton of sense. I've seen a lot of people at clubs walk around when their opponent is is thinking, and that's lost opportunity, in my opinion. So I think that's good advice. And his idea that he may have borrowed from other people, but this idea of adding a single move per game to your opening repertoire. Every time you get out of book, learn one more move, and slowly but surely you'll get better at your openings without even making that a major focus. I think that's a nice idea. So he has a few good ideas. I I think that uh, you know we've covered a lot of the the best parts of the book, and so you know I'm grateful. He, I mean, he got my money, so like it was smart of him to buy the to make the book. Uh, and and there have been a lot of people who've bought this book. So, you know, I, I give him credit for having the idea and pushing it. And I frankly think even his subtitle, A Study Plan for Adult Players, at the time this book was written, there was a lot of kid this, chess, kid that, chess. There wasn't a lot of adult player books. And so that's also kind of a genre that I think he helped promote. Yeah, he did. And that ties into and before we move on to sort of the main event in the in the woodpecker method. That's that's another sort of interesting subplot is that he kind of took some side swipes that I am Jeremy Silman in this yeah. book um, for reasons that were unclear to me. I don't know if there was like an online history, but basically he singled out uh, Jeremy Silman as sort of the exemplar as the wrong type of uh, chess instruction book. Um, people uh, who who heard um who heard the reassess your chess um, recap know that I enjoy his writing and I find him to be useful. Uh, Jeremy Soman, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his overall. So uh, that didn't sit all that well with me. And it definitely didn't sit that well with Jeremy Soman, who, you know, was obviously well-respected in the chess community, strong. I am. Um, and, uh, a book reviewer on top of that. So Silman wrote this kind of famous um, scathing takedown of rapid chest improvement shortly after it came out. And we won't get into the whole thing, but I'll just read the first paragraph of what Jeremy Silman says, which is uh, Mr. De La Maza starts out by doing something I can't stand. He tells you over and over and over page after page after page, what he's going to do for you without teaching you anything. This technique is popular in many self-help and how-to books. It serves as page filler. It revs the reader into a frenzy, and it obscures the fact that the author actually has very little of worth to say. In short, rapid chess improvement is less instructive than motivational. It incites emotion, promises far more than could or should be promised, and ultimately is nothing more than pie in the sky in view of the true lesson he's imparting. Study tactics and work your ass off. <laughs> Mr. De La Maza's well-intentioned manipulation is based on a sincere desire to help those who suffered as he did. I respect that. And I can't help agree with help but agree with his true, sometimes coded message, which is tactical skill acquired by hard work will make you much stronger. So of course, I mean people love to quote the lead paragraph, but Silman does, you know, he does vouch for the the usefulness of this book. Um, I mean, and again, the idea that tactics are going to help your chess is not groundbreaking. I think the one thing that maybe got glossed over a little bit in the Soman review is the idea of space repetition, right. um, which of course has taken a greater, greater role in the, in the sort of um, accepted chess wisdom of how to improve in subsequent years. Um, so I think that's, those are the main points from that, from rapid chess improvement. I mean, should we go through Neil, do you want to go through a little bit more of the rec the regimen that he recommends? I mean, just, uh, just in brief. Yeah, really briefly. What he recommends is you gather a thousand tactics, you work through them all. You don't spend more than 10 minutes per tactic. If you're consistently going over 10 minutes per tactic, you're trying tactics that are too hard. He recommends starting with some easier ones, mate one and two, and then working way up into more hard ones. And then after you do the whole first cycle, you do that seven times and you keep cutting your time per tactic down. So you might spend five minutes the first cycle, two and a half minutes the second cycle, et cetera, till you get down to seconds per tactic on your final cycle. And then your last day, and we've checked with some people who've actually done this, and it's anywhere from seven and a half hours 
to 15 hours people have spent nonstop in a day to do all these thousand tactics in one shot. I think that's extreme and unlikely to be done by most people, but that's basically his, you know, all or nothing uh, model. Uh, the last couple of things I'll say, and we can move on is, is, you know, people sometimes ask me how important tactics are. I look at it kind of like if you're going to use a tennis analogy, if you had a terrible backhand, you should work on it. But if you work on it and someone asks, are you winning all your games now? The answer would be no, but you still need a backhand. It's right. not enough. You, you need openings. You need strategy. You need to end games. Uh, there are 1,800 players who don't blunder. And if all you're doing is waiting for them to blunder, you're not going to win that game. So I think that tactics are necessary, but not sufficient. And if you have that mindset and you take it, you know, the best parts, then, then there's some good in the book. Yeah, I agree. And I think even De La Maza says somewhere in the book that, you you, you know, he also mentions the importance of game analysis, yeah. um, as, as do um, the authors of The Woodpecker Method. And I believe he says somewhere that um, y- you should be looking at um, – you should be looking at your games and uh, as we talk about all the time on, on perpetual chess and seeing what's determining whether you won or lost the game. Right. That was the whole driving force behind his doing this. Right. So, I mean, my general, you know, I've said this before, but my general opinion is that it, in most people's cases, it, it is tactics deciding most of the games, especially as compared to openings sure. um, at the club player level. But um, that doesn't mean that that's a universally the case. Um, so it's really whatever you're doing for chess training. Obviously, this is a funny time to be saying it should be in conjunction with tournament chess, but it should be in theory in conjunction with tournament chess. Um, and just one last thing before we move on from this book, we'll also be talking about some people who were successful with the woodpecker method. And of course, there's some overlap, but I did want to mention, oh, and just to to add one thing to what Neil mentioned, just in case we weren't crystal clear, De La Maza does have some puzzles in the back of this book, but in contrast to the woodpecker method, another reason that you don't necessarily need to buy this book is he's not really prescribing the puzzles in his book. He's just saying, gather any tactic set. Uh, whichever one is appropriate for your level. Whereas in Woodpecker Method, they actually give tactics, although they also say you can do them, you can do any set of tactics. And if this is too challenging or too easy, you can do a different one. But anyway, um, shout out again to Chess Twitter. Um, I believe it was Danny Cow who pointed me to a um, um, a chess.com thread raging debate about uh, rapid chess improvement. But in it, uh, Young Q Yu, uh, the the father of Christopher Yu, who was on the show back when he was like a ten year old or eleven year old prodigy. Now he's a thirteen year old prodigy. He's the the num the highest rated thirteen year old in the United States. Um, he's rated about twenty four fifty FIDE and about twenty five twenty five USCF. Um, and it, his dad, um, as he talked about when I interviewed him a few years ago, and has talked about in other places, his dad is is retired and clearly very smart guy who spent a lot of time thinking about um, how what the best training methods are for for Christopher. And he very patiently dealt with some swatted away some trolls in this chess.com thread and answered people's questions. But basically, he was a big. This was before Woodpecker method, right. um, and he was a big proponent. So just to read one quote from him which is I've read MDLM, Michael De La Maza, and used some of his ideas with my son, but I can't say his methods are the best. Uh, What I do know to be true, however, is that a certain high level of proficiency in tactics is required to get to USCF 2000, uh, FIDE 1950. It doesn't matter how well developed your positional muscle or opening muscles are. If you don't have a strong tactical muscle, you're not going to get there. Conversely, you can get there with a strong tactical muscle, even if those other muscles are relatively weak. So the best use of your time, if you're not already at that level, is to focus on things like visualization, calculation, and pattern recognition. If you devote, say, 80 to 90% of your chess education to those areas, you're on the right track. Um, And he said, as I've said, we've used some of these ideas, but tailored for a kid. We didn't try seven circles, meaning seven cycles of repetition, more like four or five. We did them in batches of 50 to 100, not 1,000. Um, he also mentions which resources they used, which we'll get into more later. But um, they used uh, Susan Polgar's uh, Winning Chess Tactics, I think it's called. Um, and uh, they also used CTR, which um, we'll get to later. Um, but basically, they they found ones that were appropriate, and he thinks it was um, strong driver in getting his – and he does at some point – 
Um, it's called Polgar's Chess Tactics for Champions. I'm sorry. Um, he does uh, say at some point, of course, he, f- he also thinks his son has some talent for tactics. But nonetheless, I mean, these were the methods that he used. So obviously, even though he didn't uh, adopt them word for word, I mean, that's a pretty strong endorsement of the overall methodology. And um, we'll be hearing more um, endorsements for the methodology as we get into Woodpecker. Um, But first, let's take a break and hear from our friends at Chessable. Hey, Perpetual Chess listeners. I don't think you'll be too surprised that this month's ad from our friends at Chessable is for the Woodpecker Method itself. So you, as you'll hear us discussing, it's a great book and Chessable is a great way to review it with its move trainer technology, utilizing space repetition, testing you as you go and making sure that you retain the patterns, whether it be then or later. And you can also check out Chessable's many other offerings, which also offer you the opportunity to do this, whether it be Tactics Time or Mastering Mates or any of their other tactics books, some of which are even free. So go to Chessable.com and check them out. Okay, and we are back to talk about kind of the main event, the Woodpecker Method. So quality chess book published in 2018 by GM's Axel Smith and Hans Tikkanen. Um, Tikkanen being a 35-year-old chess trainer and the, 30, and the five-time champion of Sweden. Uh, Axel Smith, also a Swedish grandmaster and trainer. Uh, he trained uh, Norwegian grandmaster Aryan Tari, among others. He's worked with Swedish youth teams. Um, his book, Pump Up Your Rating, won the 2013 Chess Cafe Book of the Year, and he actually kind of introduced the Woodpecker Method in that book. Um, apparently, in his thesis at Lund University, he wrote a novel called The Grandmasters about three chess players who race around Europe trying to take the Grandmaster's title. Um, so th- there's a little background on the authors. Um, so, Neil, were you one of these people when Woodpecker Method was coming out? Were you one of these people, like, counting the days that, that was aware of... Um, of it because uh, Axel Smith had a lot of fans from Pump Up Your Rating. You know, um, and they were, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't because I thought, first of all, honestly, I thought this sounds a lot like a book I've already bought. But I'll tell you uh, my analysis of the difference. There are three things that this, that you should ask yourself. One is, does this cycling method work? The second is, what are good puzzles to use in the cycling method? And the third is. What are, are there good answers to the puzzles that will be educational? The rapid chess improvement only does the first bit. It only has the model. It does not give the puzzles and it does not give the answers, really rich answers. So I just feel like version two, if you will, Woodpecker method is better because it has all three pieces all in one book. And it really, it, it's, it's sidesteps the fluff. It gets right into business. It only has a few intro pages around the process. And it does give at the back of the book a template for you to track your time and your, your accuracy, which is the same approach that Dilla Maza recommends. But I think the quality of the puzzles, and maybe more importantly, the quality of the answers are so high. The other real difference is this book will it will grow as you grow. It has easy puzzles, it has medium puzzles, it's got really hard puzzles. And as you get better at chess, you can you know live with this book and it can grow with you as you get better. And so I was really uh, I was hesitant to buy the book, but then once I did, I really appreciated the effort made to choose the puzzles because I think if you're practicing with the wrong equipment, you're not going to get better. So excellent puzzle selection and, frankly, even better answers. Uh, and this idea that you can get partial credit or full credit, that level of depth often doesn't occur in um, in puzzles. So I, I really appreciated that Woodpecker Method really nailed the second two components, not just the methodology. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely love this book. And as I said at the top, I mean, of course, it's been recommended a bunch of times. So it was I felt slightly guilty that I hadn't gotten into it, but I haven't been training my chess lately. And this more than any other book is a chess training book. And as I'll I'll discuss more of my own experience a little bit later, but just to give a little more uh, background, um, the other thing, I mean, there's lots of things to admire about this book, but another thing is that being 16 years later and being that these, this is written by stronger players, this already had some proof of concept because um, Axel Smith in Pump Up Your Rating talked about the Woodpecker Method. By the way, the name comes from his co-author, Hans Tikkanen. Apparently, uh, some translations in, in Tikkanen is um, Finnish and, or has Finnish heritage. And sometimes um, 
one of the translations of his name is Little Woodpecker. Hmm. So Axel Smith took that because Tikkanen had had great success uh, using basically this type of methodology. In the spring of 2010, he was around the age of 25. Uh, he drilled hard on the Woodpecker method and got three GM norms and passed the 2500 rating. Uh, the next year, his rating peaked to 2601. And he said before that, he'd been kind of spinning his wheels for a few years. Um, he had a friend I believe um, somewhere in this outline, his name is Hagen. Um, sorry for the delay. His name is Andreas Hagen, who had who went from like again, he worked full time um, at another job. He was like twenty nine years of age, and uh, he um, went from so. And he's one of these people, like a lot of us, who took time away from chess and then came back. And he was rated, I think it was twenty two ninety, and then. Uh, reached a rating of like 2450. Um, sorry, um, there we go. Sorry, sorry for the delay, guys. Um, he he went from 2290 to 2454 in a four month span after doing this. And this is again based on the methodology, but before um, before Woodpecker method had been uh, read. And apparently, Tikkanen and, and, and Andres Hagen had both read this book called Talent is Overrated by Jeffrey Colvin that kind of inspired them to use a training program based on space repetition. And from there, they devised this program and they just had kind of staggering success. Um, and we'll get more into the sort of the people who've tried it and lots have had success and some haven't. But that's just sort of even going into the book, like there's already these like huge results um, from these people. So um, th those are sort of, that's sort of the, the big picture view. One other thing I should mention, um, of course, the book's available on Chessable. Um, Neil has the paper copy. Um, I just did it on Chessable, which obviously Chessable is a sponsor of the show. So, um, uh, but I mean, for, for books like this in particular, I find it so pleasant. I mean, you can't do their exact scoring method. Like Chessable's interface doesn't automatically do their scoring method, but it does a facsimile. But more importantly, it's just nice to get the automatic feedback because uh, somewhere... I think it was Hagen in an interview was talking about um, the drudgery of grading your your puzzles. Hmm. So uh, Chessable can at least, um, obviously it's a great place to do it because it remembers which puzzles to retest you on, and um, it, but it also instantly grades your puzzles. But in addition to it being available on Chessable, it's available from Quality Chess, and they have an excerpt of the book um, available from their website. And the excerpt is quite generous. The excerpt kind of uh, out, lays out the philosophy and gives a couple puzzles. So obviously, if you're able to, highly recommend the book, whether you get it on Chessable or in paper form. Um, but if you're just curious and want to read more, I'll link to the Quality Chess link and you can check it out. And we're still going to dig into the book, but I just wanted to to get that out of the way um, before before we go farther. So Neil, did you only use the paper version? I only use the paper version. I, I, uh, I really enjoyed it. And what was surprising to me is kind of how I did. So I there are 1,128 puzzles, 22, uh, 222 are easy, 762 are intermediate, and the, the rest, the 144 are advanced. I started with the easy, uh, which the book recommends, and I, I did pretty well on those. I, I didn't go through all 222. But I went through a bunch of them, and I was getting like a 90% rate on those. And so I, I decided to push myself towards the intermediates. And I frankly found I did pretty well on the intermediates too. And, and what I attribute that to is once you have, uh, you know, built up some visualization and calculation abilities, once you can see a board in your head four moves, five moves deep, then you really are ready to start tackling some intermediate puzzles. And the patterns that are common around, uh, you know, knowing all the motifs, pins and skewers and back rank, rank mates and the rest of it, uh, it really helps you prepare yourself for harder puzzles. So I, I really enjoyed the puzzles themselves. I appreciated their, uh, their answers even more because I've read lots of puzzle books and many of them are good puzzles, but they'll give maybe the first two or three uh, uh, variations, and then it's for you to figure out why uh, it's uh, good or not, where, where the Woodpecker Method authors really take the time to explain why you're better after after the moves it recommends, which is really helpful. 
Yeah, it is. Um, they, yeah, they they do a good job through and through. And uh, one other one other detail, I would I would guess maybe for anyone wondering, like for what level, like below what level should one not get this book? What do you think, Neil? Fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred, something around there. I would say, yeah, I, I would say first work on some um, Maiden one and twos if you're like below fourteen hundred. Uh, and you don't need the book, you can just use the method that we've described. But I think once you get, I would say, you know, 1500 to whatever, maybe, you know, 22, 2300, like we'll probably get some benefit from this. I mean, I've beaten players in slow tournament games over 2000, and I'm more like a 1700 player. And I did that purely by um, seeing basic tactics that they missed. So I, I think even 2,000 players sometimes overestimate their ability to do basic tactics. So I think lots of people could benefit from this book. Yeah, yeah. And again, as you mentioned, because they have different sections. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I had a similar experience. I mean, the, the easy ones, I'd say, are probably average, I don't know, 1,400, 1,500 level. It's a lot of like made in two type puzzles and stuff like that. Um, but once you get to intermediate, I mean, I, you know, I'm used to be, 2250 or whatever now i'm 2150 and you know not definitely like especially coming into the to starting this book up like not as sharp as i used to be for sure when it comes to chess tactics but uh so the intermediate one started out challenging but i could feel myself getting a little sharper just as i went on from from going through that now obviously there might be some sort of um um oh man i'm drawing a blank uh uh what's the word for the the fake drug effect I'm, oh placebo placebo thank you <laughs> it's late here yeah obviously there might be some sort of placebo effect but i mean i'm i'm just visualizing things just by maintaining a daily practice um a lot faster um so and i'm you know like i said i'm 2150 but kostya kovyutsky friend of the show i am great youtube channel all, everything, all his content is great. He streamed the whole thing. Right. So another thing you can do if you're interested in just checking it out, you're not sure, is uh, if you go to his YouTube channel, and of course I'll link to it, you can watch him stream the whole thing, which of course is helpful on many levels. One, you'll get a better feel for what the material is like, but also you'll see a, a really strong player, um, how, how they approach these puzzles. Um, so, and again, if you're below 1400, there's plenty of other books you can use. And before, before we go, we'll give you a few recommendations of different books that you can use. A um, couple other things to mention about this book. Um, they use games from world champions. Um, what, what did you think about that, Neil? I thought that was cool. In fact, I, I skipped through some of the advanced stuff just to look at it. I noticed Lasker's double bishop sacrifice, and I've seen in enough puzzle books to know some famous games. But I, I thought I thought it was cool, and and I think it gives you a little chess culture, a little chess history. And I should probably also say, you know, I've been doing daily chess tra tactics training for like four years straight, and so I'm not surprised that like the intermediates were a little more up my alley after doing four years daily versus you not doing four years daily. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think that even I found a lot of value, even though, you know, I do tactics pretty much every single day. So, I mean, if, if, if someone is doing them every day is getting value, then probably most people would get some value out of this book. Yeah, for sure. And I loved the world champion because I mean, to me, it's like a hook because I mean, there's some famous, there's some famous combinations in there, but it's also just, just to, to see them and get a little more perspective for different players. So, I mean, the book would be great even without that, but it just, for, for me to, to see those names and then see the combinations. And as they mentioned in the introduction, a lot of, a lot of even these world championship games, uh, at least at the end, we're finished off with basic tactics. So, I mean, that just shows how, how important tactics are. Um, yeah. And, and I'm, you know, this was good timing, Neil, because your suggestion of this book for a number of reasons with the, with the quarantine going on and everyone trying to crack the chess books hard, I was actually planning and hoping to, to finally come back to tournament chess, make another push, like right before this happened, that stuff happened. So of course this book is perfect for that. I mean, I, I'm, you know, it does, it does sting a little bit that you're lacking sort of the, um, the, um, the natural complement of playing tournament games, but it's, I'm, um, I'm having fun with it even without like the potential reward of, um, 
of playing in tournaments and and seeing if I can um, recover some long lost rating points. But you're playing in the Twitter tournament, right? Yeah, I am. Yeah, so yeah. I played one. I played one game in that. Shout out to the Twitter tournament. Yeah, I expect you to crush everyone now that you're using the woodpecker <laughs> method. Yeah, I mean baby steps. I mean, <laughs> it's it's hard for me because my as I've talked about, I've talked in here before. My opening repertoire is like a twenty year old train wreck. Um, so again, shout out to Chessable. I've been going through some of their courses, but I'm really trying to be diligent about like I have. I have on a good day, 45 minutes and on a bad day, 15 minutes. Like I'm basically just some days ringing the register on my streak, like just (laughs) get in there, do some tactics and all right, I did something, you know? So it's hard with the openings because I understand the impulse to want to improve them, but I really do think, and I can feel it doing the woodpecker method. I can feel that it's like, you know, I took... I took French in high school and and Russian in uh, college, and it's a similar feeling. Whereas you get going, it starts to come back more, you know. Yeah. And I and I don't get that from studying openings, you know. So. Yeah, I I frankly think openings has a lot to do with memory, and tactics has a lot to do with skill. And skills are things like muscles; they get stronger as you use them. So I think that there's something interesting about tactics that that you really can tell when you're you're practicing. And I'm a big believer in uh, if if I only have time, I'll do one in a day. You know, yeah. and I did something. You know, that's yeah. It's always uh, frequency over volume. Frequency always trumps volume. Yeah, I mean, as Jakob Argard said, I mean. Th- just you want to keep it in your consciousness so that your subconscious mind um, is still has some chess in it. Um, and, and yeah, just, just this little mini comeback. I mean, I, you know, I had the from familiar to any chessable user feeling of, I, I had a streak of around 20 days and then I just totally brain farted one day and then I had to start over and now I'm at 20 days again, something like that. So baby steps, but yeah, it's a, it's um good to be back and it, and it, and of course, that has practical applications, someone like me, because um, one thing we should say, I mean, this this method is not, um, these guys work very, very hard, you know, like, I mean, the guy Hagen that, that they mentioned in Pump Up Your Rating, he did it while having a full-time job, but Axel Smith and a lot of the people we're going to mention later who've tried it were spending many hours a day. And for me, that's, as, as we were talking before we started recording, you know, that's just not going to happen. So I can't. I can't uh, do exactly what they prescribe, but I'm I'm a big enough believer in space repetition generally that even if, I feel like even if I do a mini version, um, I feel like from what we know about chess knowledge acquisition and brain science at at this particular moment, it's about the best I could do. Yeah, and if what I found is if I do two hundred in a chunk, I can get through all my cycles in about a month, and I can get through. 200 in my final cycle in under an hour and if you can if you have 30 to 45 minutes you can do a variant of the woodpecker method and i guarantee you will get better everyone will get better because it's it's a skill that you can get better at tactics is frankly uh, a visualization skill yeah and and as you mentioned earlier neil the the possibility of um of burnout so we'll we'll get to the people who had great success with it um but a uh, friend of the show, Peter Newhall, Newhall said he spent a lot of time on it. And I, as I was um, going through the quality chess blog, I think it was Peter weighing in um, um, in the in the comments. I mean, he was one of the people ready for the book to come out. And I feel like it. he said something like it didn't didn't seem that revolutionary for him. Dr. Potzer on Twitter mentioned that he felt like it was sapping his joy for chess. So seems like uh, someone who might have been hitting the books a little too hard and maybe just trying to bite off more than he can chew, which obviously, you know, his heart was in the right place. So, I mean, it's not like uh, universally lauded. So it, it is important to adapt it to your life situation. Um, for, and for me, it's like I'm always like I do it after the kids go to bed. So I'm always tired. But, you know, I'm, that it is what it is, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, so what other points do we need to, before we get into the people who've successfully used this, um, I feel like we've raised, we've given a decent summary. Um, yeah, I mean, anything? the thing I would, I would finish with, which again, it's a big, big difference between the first book 
rapid chest improvement and woodpecker method is is they're really flexible. They really recommend, you know, if you're if if the first few easy puzzles are hard, then just go after those 200 or so. And even if you think that they're pretty easy, it wouldn't be bad to review them if you're more advanced. So I think I really appreciate the flexibility that the authors give you. It's not an all or nothing. And that's frankly more the realistic for someone's life. Yeah. And it's not just the authors, you know, these, they're just guessing like the rest of us, you know, like, I mean, they're very well-respected trainers and they've had great success, but, um, I've compared chess learning to, to nutrition before I, I stand by that comparison. I mean, we're all just guessing, you know? So do I think the evidence at this point, um, it's fairly strong that space repetition of um, patterns that you will encounter is, is an effective training method. So find a way to work it into what your lifestyle is. Um, so I, I'm, you know, personally, I'm hoping to, you know, I, I'm as I, my tactic set ended up being like uh, 200, I, all of the easy ones and about a hundred of the intermediate ones. And I think as Neil mentioned, it's 222 easy, 762 intermediate, 144 advanced. Um, and that's just what it is. And hopefully from there, I'll go, go to the intermediate, maybe take a break and go back to the original set. But I mean, I definitely feel the difference and, um, we should talk some more about some other people who have had success with this, which there are many. Um, so, um, n- Number one, uh, Elijah Logazar, chessable author, um, had amazing success with this. I mean, he's super driven um, and young, it should be said, which <laughs> we, we can get into that as well. But I think Elijah's 17 or 18, um, but he's written about it in the chessable forums. He actually, so he did the, the method as prescribed, which we should say Axel Smith. So uh, Hans Tikkanen had already done the woodpecker method as prescribed, which is on the last day. You're doing all uh, whatever it is, 1128 puzzles in one day, um, which is crazy. And Coast just streamed that and did it, I believe, in seven hours. I can't remember if he did the advanced ones. But in any event, um, to do them all in one day is quite ambitious. And basically, it requires that you're training like a chess professional. Um, so Axel Smith said that when he did it, he did it, it took him 22 hours and his wife was just bringing him bread and that was it. <laughs> right. So, so that, that shows how far you can go with this. Although Elijah Logazar said he did the whole thing in three hours and, uh, streamed it on Twitch. Unfortunately, the archive is not available, but I mean, this guy is quite industrious as anyone who's familiar with, um, his book reviews. I mean, he's, he's churning out like two book reviews a week, basically, um, and, you know, his rating has been, you know, he's a USCF master now and his rating has just been been going up. So, you know, when you're young and hungry, it can make a huge difference for your chess. And this is a quote from Elijah. Um, thank you, Elijah, for answering my questions. He says, um, his blitz rating peaked about 50 points during the week when he did the woodpecker method. He measured his rating before and after and was playing actively before. So it was not a coincidence over the two years. Over the last two years, his chess.com blitz rating peaked by around 350 points. Obviously, I worked on a lot of other things, but my tactics training helped a lot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he just, he's a strong proponent, and and there are many others. I mean, Kostya Kovutsky, the aforementioned. I mean, the fact that he was, that Kostya streamed the whole thing, I think, um, gave it a slightly, it was... Um, slightly less rigorous than it would be if you're not talking through the whole thing. But Costa said he definitely felt sharper afterwards. Um, it should be mentioned, Andrew Greet, um, I am Andrew Greet of Quality Chess, blogged about the whole experience because there was kind of a buildup on the Quality Chess blogs to when these books were coming out. And he was playing in the 2018 Olympiad. So he went through the method and he works for Quality Chess. So he was working full time at the time. And he generally was happy with, um, with, how it made him feel. It made him feel like he was sharper, but the one tournament he was prepping for the Olympiad, he ended up with a disappointing result. Um, so of course it's a tiny sample, but just gives you, Oh, a friend of mine in Pittsburgh, Gabe Pettish, 2400 USCF, super strong. He's someone who's been using the woodpecker method, but not doing it exactly as prescribed. So, um, lots of different experiences, but I think the overall takeaway is, um, it's worth incorporating somehow. Yeah. And I would say, uh, you know, you can be 18. I mean, I started doing this process of daily cycling through tactics in my late forties. And I can tell you, I could, I struggled to see 
two move, three move uh, visualization exercises. And now I can do five, six, seven, eight, sometimes eight. So that's just, uh, it's a skill. You got to believe you can get better. And if you work at it, you will. Yeah, you can. Um, although, of course, I do feel like we have to mention generally while we're talking about brain science that, uh, that you know, neuro, neuroplasticity is a thing that exists. So whenever I'm reading the sort of testimonials from people who have, who have had various degrees of success with whether it be rapid chess improvement, woodpecker method, or anything else chess related. <laughs> For me, one of the first things I always want to check is the their um, their age, and then I want to think about their life circumstances. Right. Um, because and and not so much um, not like a a jealousy thing. Um, it's just um, it provides important context. So I mean, I mentioned that Elijah's young and hungry and working very hard on his chess, um, but uh, the exemplar of um, Tikkanen's friend who made it to IM in 2450, um, Hagen is someone who better circumstances, although he was still in his 20s, which of course, again, the science isn't fully settled, but it seems pretty clear that the older you get, the, you know, the, the harder it is to form new neural pathways and kind of the slower you are to observe absorb patterns. So I'm Neil, you're a great example. And I'm looking forward at some point to interviewing you and getting more into your experience as an adult improver. Um, you're a great example of what can be done. But I do think you, uh, anyone needs to calibrate their expectations based on age. And you know, if anyone listening is like, um, poo pooing that thought, um, you know, I would, I would love to be wrong, you know, and, and it's not my opinion. I'm not a scientist, obviously. Um, but I, I would love it if like, um, you know, fully formed working adults could, could find ways to optimize their chess improvement more and more and just achieve more and more. Um, I I'm all for that, but as it is, it does seem like most of the anecdotes I come across about people with the the most like jaw dropping success tend to be people uh, below the age of of thirty. Yeah, I, I, I'll agree with that. I mean, I I took a few lessons from a really well known grandmaster who told me uh, that he in a summer he just spent a summer working on Reinfeld's uh, hundred and one best uh, you know ch- combinations books. And in one summer, he kind of shot up. And I know Silman in one of his books talks about like there was a summer where he jumped from like 1400s to like 1800s. Like I never got that kind of a jump. And I don't know that you can in your 40s have that kind of a jump. What took them we, uh, months might take me years. But I think uh, it's still true that you can get better. Yeah, exactly. You can definitely get better. And, uh, you know, it's a double whammy because it's like you're assimilating the pattern slower and you have more obligations. Um, especially as compared to a teenager, but even someone in their twenties um, often is not going to be married with kids, which makes a big difference sure. um, depending on on what their career circumstances are like. Um, so, just something to keep in mind. I mean, and of course, uh, as Silman said in his quote, like you know, if you do a lot of tactics and work really hard, um, you'll get better at chess. But I mean, the 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 key takeaway from these two books is also to to incorporate repetition um to to make sure that you're repeating patterns and and of course these books both have their exact prescription but as neil and i have both said i don't think that's i don't think i don't think the seven circles i don't think it's seven times is the reason that de la maza was successful right um and it's not because there's exactly you know 1100 something puzzles that woodpecker method is successful um, so one other thing, Neil, is I feel like we should give some book recommendations for different levels for people who might be thinking about, um, trying some sort of, um, uh, space repetition tactics regimen. Um, so do you, do any come to mind for you? Yeah, I, I really like I mean, the ones that Dan Heisman recommended. I will recommend if you're just starting off, uh, there's a, a Bain chess tactics for students books. That's good. It's very basic, but it's good. I really liked Simple checkmates by um, Gillum. I think that's another. You gotta you gotta start with the foundations of knowing the different kinds of mates. I know you like, and I I love the uh, Coakley books, all of them. You know, yeah. so I would start not with the blue one, which is a little harder, but I would start with the Chess Puzzles for Kids volumes one and two, and then go to the strategy book, and then the blue book. I think that 
uh, what's each one of those is, is uh, the tactics books are 900 puzzles each. And they keep showing the same pattern with different variations over and over again. And what that does is it ingrains these patterns in your brain. And so those are all kind of more um, basic level ones. I, I really loved Polgar's Chess Tactics for Champions. All of these books are in my eight, set of 8,000. Tactics Time 1 and 2 uh, I also have in, in the set. And so all of those are ones I highly recommend. Great, yeah. And... um we should mention some of these books are on Chessable, some of these books are in ebooks. So they all come in different formats. Um, and Neil is quite industrious making flashcards, but some of you might not be into that. So you may want to think about whether you can do them on Chessable. I know in the Chessable threads, some people were looking in particular for books that were at a slightly lower level um, than, than Woodpecker that they could use the same method. And I know that Chessable has added on some tools where you can use sort of the same um, general approach and like have them test you the same way. So I know that Tactics Time is on there. I think they're working on getting the Coakley books there. Um, one question I had for you, Neil, because I, I heard you mention a couple of the mate puzzle books. One concern I had is like, one thing I like about the Woodpecker method is that the open-ended nature of the quizzes. Right. Um, now, I know that as you're newer to chess, it can be more overwhelming to solve a puzzle without any kind of direction. So do you think that it's like, do you think it might stunt their growth to only be doing checkmate patterns, like to, to be primed for looking for checkmate? Or is it just so important to get those patterns that it's, it's okay? I think in the very beginning, it's kind of like a lot of people say, start with end games. I, I think that if you don't know how to mate with two rooks, or if you don't know how to mate with a king and a queen, then... Uh, or even a rook and a king, uh, or two bishops. I mean, all of those basic mating patterns, I think you have to know because then you're walking into your end games confident that if you have overwhelming material, you will end the game with a win. I think, though, that what I, what I don't like are the books where they say, well, here are all the pins, and then here are all the skewers, and then here are all the forks, and here are all the mates. I actually think that that's, uh, it gives the illusion of knowledge and and no one during a game one says this is a win and they right. definitely don't say this is a win with a pin you know yeah. so i purposely whenever i've i've bought books and one of the benefits of flashcards is i mix them up so that there is no pattern uh, uh i'm actually right now making tactics cards out of practical chess uh exercises which is an awesome book and maybe we can talk about that in another episode uh, that Ray Ch Chen uh, wrote. Yeah, yeah, great book. And, and he purposely didn't have any any pattern or rhyme or reason to it. He puts in some positional stuff. He puts in some tactical stuff. You have no idea whether it's a defensive tactic or an offensive tactic. I think that that's how games are. And so I think once you get past the very basics, you should mix it up. Yeah, and again, um, Axel Smith, he, he's written an opening book for Quality Chess. Um, uh, something involving E3. Um, and um, uh, I believe it was Hagen and another trainer wrote like a King's Indian book where basically people are experimenting with space repetition in different formats where you could try it with end games. As you mentioned, you could try it with like Helston's positional puzzles or Agard's positional puzzles. It's not necessarily limited to tactics. To me, um, it's more the repeating of patterns. There's if I if I were to place one higher than the other, it's the the testing and the repeating of patterns is even more important than the fact that it's tactics. I mean, Chessable's made a whole business on this um, science of repetition. Yeah, exactly. So like it works on all things, all, all elements of chess. And I have end game puzzles I, I've reviewed. I've got positional puzzles I've reviewed. I've got opening puzzles. When I get to a point in the opening, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I can make a puzzle, a card out of that, much like you can on Chessable. So the space repetition works for all elements of chess, I think. Yeah. And one other thing we should mention, I mean, all this stuff costs money. I know that, that I mean, especially right now, um, my, money can be tight. I mean, I believe on Chess Tempo, you can make a tactic set for free. Um, so you can just randomly make a tactic set and then just work from that um, and then repeat it. Um, but certainly there are cost effective ways that you can do this. Although, you know, again, um, depending on your, you, at, often it will be like, if you spend a little bit of money, if you buy a course on Chessable, or if you buy a book with a nice layout where you can just thumb through the book and then do it again, um, it'll save you a lot of time. So 
I mean, there's, there's always a trade-off, but, but there is that possibility. Um, one other thing in just scrolling through my outline that I forgot to mention when we were talking about um, successful adherence, I forgot to mention with rapid chest improvement that um, there's another strong uh, adherent or at least someone who had a lot of success and it is famous chess Twitter personality, Mr. Dodgy. Oh um, yeah. Who is, who's actually a strong player. Um, I don't know his exact, I don't know his exact strength, but I mean, I think in the, sorry if I'm insulting you here, Mr. Dodgy, but I would venture in the 21 to 2400 range just to give myself a lot of wiggle room. Um, but, but, um, so, and the reason of course he used De La Maza is because, um, he is old like us, Neil. Yeah. So, so this was what was out. So here's a quote from Mr. Dodgy, uh, who weighed in on Twitter. He said, I started playing OTB in 2004, got a first national rating of 1685 in 2005, just after getting my first rating, I played a fern- tournament and finished with a tournament performance rating of 1640 in, in August of 2005, I did the seven circles. That's, uh, De La Maza's prescribed, um, repetition, method and my next tpr was 2130 ish it took a while to get enough free day rated games but but by next summer my first free day was 2081 so not quite 400 points in 400 days which is what de la maza said but pretty dang close and pretty impressive from mr dodgy um although again he did say i think he was 18 at the time so yeah i i always do feel like you have to take age into account but obviously this method works if you're and obviously the the harder you work at it the more success you will have Definitely, and and I uh, I like that he went full old school and did the um, the CRT or uh, the you know the the, the CD the the CD ROM that uh, De La Maza recommends. Yeah, CTR. CTR. Yeah, yeah. which which I actually I think has a free app, so that's another possibility that you can do. I think someone said there's other you know if you dig around and I'll link to a bunch of the threads that we read. There's free chess tactics apps that might have a thousand puzzles on them, and as Neil said, honestly unless you're spending multiple hours a day, I don't think a thousand is the proper amount to have in your cycle. Cause it's more important to like, when you go back to review, it shouldn't have been like three months ago, you know? So, um, yeah, I think it's more important to have ha- have it not be too distant in your memory. Yeah, the other thing yeah. I would say is I would really be curious if anyone who spent eight to 15 hours did any tactics the next day. Yeah, I mean, it seems like some of these people were were pushing pretty hard. We'll have to ask Elijah. No, and you know, from from the sense I get from him, he he may have just woke up and started grinding again, especially if he was able to do the uh, do the whole book in three hours. That's true. Um, so I think that wraps it up, Neil. Did we get everything about these two? I mean, not everything, but did we hit the major points of these two books? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think we did. I think, uh, De La Maza broke ground uh, and it was version one and it was good. It was mostly theory. I think, uh, the woodpecker method was version two. It had not just the theory, but the, the problems and the answers, which are obviously better to have all three. And, you know, I, I think that if, if you find a way to, practice this kind of uh, repetition in in some way that you make a daily habit your chess will get better i mean one of the things i do is i actually have a chess tactics playlist i only play it when i'm doing tactics i i put it on when i'm i'm on my train or i do it when i'm doing it from home and when that first song hits you know i know i'm in tactics uh focus time and so there are a lot of things you can do uh, you can also like give yourself a reward when you're done. Like I tend to post a chess puzzle I found interesting that day on Twitter. And that's a little reward for me for, for doing the work. So there's a lot of little t- tips and tricks you can do to keep it interesting on a daily basis. Nice. What's the song, Neil? Oh, what's my song? Yeah. Let me just see what my first one is. It's, uh, hold on. Cause I, I don't th- tend to look at the names. It, one second. It is. Um, My House by Flo Rida. I love it. Okay, nice. Yeah, get hype. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, cool. When, well, Neil, thank you for this suggestion. It was a great idea and it worked out. The timing worked out great. Again, I know um, a lot of people, um, people, at least some listeners will have more time than usual to spend on chess. So I think um, it's, a, it's a great time to sort of dig into this and uh, give people a framework great well ben it's been an honor for me you have so many of my chess heroes on your show and it's just great to be on with you 
Thanks. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we'll get the donation to Metro Chess um, next month. The next Perpetual Chess Chess Books Recaptured will be with my friend Jen Shahadi. Um, and she has volunteered to discuss How I Beat Fisher's Record by Judith Polgar, which is an awesome book. So obviously between having Jen join me and getting to talk about that book, I'm excited for that one as well. Um, but Neil, thanks again. And also uh, listeners, and especially everyone who contributed to all the threads, whether it was like direct interaction or just a previous discussion on Chess Reddit, Chess Twitter, um, Chessable, Chess.com, all of that stuff. Thank you for thank you to everyone that contributed. You guys really helped to make it a better show because there's there's been so many um, discussions online about this stuff. So Neil and I are trying our best or have tried our best to to synthesize it, but uh, but we hope this was of some use. And Neil, I, with, on that note, we will say goodbye, and then we'll get to the blindfold puzzle. So thanks again, Neil. Thank you. All right, guys. Neil Bruce has called it a night, so it's just me, and I'm about to dig into the monthly blindfold chess puzzles. But before I do, in reviewing my outline, I realized I forgot one quote that I wanted to be sure to share in our conversation. It is another one from Young Q Yu. I am Christopher Yu's dad, who in the chess.com forum discussing rapid chess improvement said, just one last piece of advice. The less time you have for your chess study, all the more important it is to devote a greater portion of that time to visualization, calculation, and pattern recognition. And I think that's true. My recent conversation with adult improver Terry Chapman about how he just did a little bit of tactics a day, and that made a big difference in regaining some lost rating points, something I also would like to do. So I just think that that's a good note to end on. As you have more time to study, obviously you can sprinkle in the many great elements of chess and games openings, positional puzzles and all that stuff. But if you're only doing 20 minutes a day, it's probably best to focus on tactics. And speaking of tactics, it is time for the blindfold chess puzzles. So this month, I was able to take them from the books we discussed. So puzzle number one is from Rapid Chess Improvement by Michael De La Maza. It is a mate in two puzzle. And I would guess that it's for anyone rated around 1300 should be able to get it. If you can picture the position, you can probably solve the puzzle. So here come white's pieces. White has a queen on A8, a knight on E2, and a king on B1. Black has pawns on H3 and G2, threatening to promote, and a king on H2. So it's white to move and mate in two, and I'm going to repeat the configuration. And also, I always have the configuration in the show description without a diagram. So if you just want to double check it, or if you didn't catch it, you can always just look at the pros in the diagram at the bottom of the show description, you'll find where the pieces are. So here they are again, white has a queen on a eight, a knight on e two, and a king on b one. And black has pawns on h three, and g two, and a king on h two. And it is white to move and mate in two. Okay, puzzle number two is from Woodpecker Method. This one is fairly challenging. So I would guess maybe around 2000 level, something like that. Not a lot of pieces on the board, but it's a tricky king and pawn puzzle. So it is white to move and win. White has a king on e6, a pawn on f5, and a pawn on h2. Black has a pawn on g7, and a king on e4. So to repeat, it is white to move and win from the woodpecker method. White has a king on e6, a pawn on f5, and a pawn on h2. Black has a pawn on g7, and a king on e4. And this is actually from a Capablanca game. It is an intermediate level puzzle from the woodpecker method. So white to move and win. Try it out. If you And as always, if you would like to find the answers, you can click through to a link in the show description. So thanks for listening, everyone. I hope you all are doing okay. And I will catch you guys soon. 
Special thanks to my producer, Matthew Passy, and thanks to you all for continuing to listen to and spread the word about Perpetual Chess. You can spread the word on Twitter. Follow me. I'm at Beneficial1. You can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group and continue the dialogue about each interview after it is released. I also want to thank the people who've written a few new reviews on Apple Podcasts. That's good to see. Reviews on other podcast platforms and YouTube are also appreciated. But of course, most of all, I would like to thank the people who provide financial support to the show, especially these days as a lot of our lives are in upheaval. We're stuck at home. There's work changes and all that stuff. So it means the world to me that you guys have stuck with me and even in some cases added new support in these crazy times time so thanks i really appreciate it for anyone who's able to support it is the perpetual chess patreon page where you can donate through paypal if you go to perpetualchesspod.com so with that out of the way first of all of course i would like to thank the sponsor of the show chessable and i also would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities for their support they include Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natel, Greg Shahadi, Guven Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, Lorraine Dore, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster 9000, Peter Sodi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, and I also would like to give thanks to the following people and entities Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Peja, FM Andre Tarakov, Andrew Perry, Anidi Deer, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, aka Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Bleskachek, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Lucas of the U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramerly of Chessable.com, Douglas Matthew, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Ian Mason, I am elect or possibly not I am elect, Donnie Ariel Esquire, Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Francis Latart Lavoie, Francis Tortoris, MD, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Hans Schutt, Harish Srinivasan, Jacob Kovach, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Bonastia, James Murr, Jason Anfang, Jason Willem, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, J.J. Stranod, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman of the U.S. Chess Federation, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Reifforth, Laura Beljowski, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Alert, Miguel Araspati, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Solin, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hollenbach, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Dougherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Thomas Kolmanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Juniper, William Hogarth, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko Soyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone, and I will catch you all soon.